this part of our service, we're going to have our scripture reading. If you have your Bible with you, would you turn with me please to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and turning to chapter 6, very well-known passage of God's precious word. Genesis chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 1. The word of God says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Amen. We'll end our reading there at verse 9. May the Lord bless to us the public reading of his own inspired and his infallible word. Now we're turning again to the book of Genesis and to Genesis chapter 6 and to these verses that remind us and tell us about Noah, the man of God. Uh, Noah speaks of spiritual renewal. He was a man who walked with God in a very sinful and wicked age. And God blessed him, and indeed God favored him. And I know that the story of Noah uh, has been taught to us since our childhood and thank God for the story of Noah and the ark and every time therefore you're driving and there's been a shower of rain and you see the sun shining and you see a rainbow immediately you think about Noah and the ark and the bow that God placed in the sky to say that never again would he destroy the world with a universal flood. And although this story of Noah is, I say, it's universally known, we have been taught it from childhood, and it is etched, as it were, in our minds and in our memories, yet there's so very much more that often we forget about Noah, and so much more we need to learn even about Noah and the ark. And Someone once described Noah uh, in a series of character studies he was conducting on different men and women of faith in the Bible. They said Noah was a downright, upright man. And that's a wonderful description of Noah. He was a downright, upright man. The Bible says that Noah found grace, in verse 8, in the eyes of of the Lord. But I want to think with you for a moment or two about the day and the age in which Noah lived. And I want you to think, as it were, first of all, that Noah's world was reprobate. It was a very wicked and very sinful age in which Noah was called to serve God. And of course, just like the rainbow is a perfect circle. Yet, as it were, even in history, 
things repeat themselves. And the Lord Jesus Christ reminded us in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 24 and in verse 38, he said, For as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also the coming of the Son of Man be. And he said, In the days, in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And the Lord Jesus exhorts us here to remember what the Bible says about the days of Noah. Because Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, that is what it will be like in the days just leading up to and prior to and preceding his coming again in power and in great glory. And you'll find even as you read there in the book of Genesis and chapter 6 that it was a day of, of great apostasy and great immorality and great wickedness. The Bible says there that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took uh, of all wives, but they chose in verse 2. And then verse 4 says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bare them children uh, to them, and the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And as you read through the book of Genesis, in chapter 4, we read about Cain, and we read about his descendants, and about their ungodliness, and about their wickedness against God. You come into chapter 5, and you read there about the descendants of Seth, the one who was given to Adam and Eve in place, as it were, of Abel. And we read about the godly line of Seth. But when you come to chapter 6, we read about the ungodly and the godly and intermarriage between those two lines. And it always comes wrong and things go wrong. God always called his people to a walk of separation before him. It was God who said to the children of Israel in the book of Exodus, God makes a difference between Israel and the nations that were surrounding them. And God was to have a people, and they were to be an example, and they were to be different, and they were to be separated from all the other nations of the world. And it is so even to this very day, as far as the, 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 the people of Israel are concerned, and in many countries of the world, uh, people go maybe from Northern Ireland, from the South of Ireland, from the United Kingdom, from Europe, maybe go into the place like the United States of America, and they are assimilated in with all the peoples there into that nation. But yet the, the people of Israel, they always seem to stand out and to stand alone as a, were a separated kind of people. And that's the way God expects his people, the, the church of God, the Israel of God to be in this world, a, a separated people from the things of this world. The Bible still says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but be ye separate. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And God calls his people to a separated walk. There's a story told that during the American Civil War, the soldiers came upon a man. He was a wild kind of character. But during the American Civil War, they found this old man walking about, raving. But he had on him the tunic, the coat of the Yankees. But he had on him the trousers of the Confederates. And it reminds you a wee bit of John Bunyan when he wrote in his great Pilgrim's Progress of Mr. Facing 
both ways. I suppose that poor old soul was keeping his options right. If he ran into the Confederates, he would say he was a Confederate. If he ran into the Yankees, he would say he was a Yankee. But that's the way, it is. That's the way people are in this world today. They want a foot in both camps. They want to have a little bit of Christianity, just enough to save their soul and keep them out of a lost hell, but yet they, they want to go the world's way and, and to live just the way the world lives. But God calls us in this day of great apostasy and wickedness and immorality in a world that is reprobate, just as Noah's world was reprobate. And even as we're uh, uh, having this time of prayer against the laws that are being passed in our uh, land in these days, we see just how far they have gone away from God's precious word. I was speaking last night on Lurgan, and it was a harvest service, but I was preaching about the word of God and the book of Nehemiah, and there was a French author who spoke about uh, England, and he said, England had two great books, he says. Shakespeare and the Bible. He said, England made Shakespeare, but the Bible made England. And the secret of England's greatness and the secret of Great Britain's greatness for many, many years was the adherence to the word of the living God. But now they have set the word of God aside and as one old preacher said, if you don't stand for the word of God, you'll fall for anything. And we live in a reprobate world and a day of immorality. Even the Bible tells us there as we read through the, the generations and, and the, the lineage of Cain and, and then Seth. But the Bible reminds us there of immorality in chapter 4 and verse 17 uh, uh, talks about Cain, his wife, she conceived in bar Enoch, he built a city, and the name of the city, uh, and called his son Enoch, verse 19, Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillai. No uh, commission or command from God, but he chose to do that. The Bible says, husband should be the husband of one wife. But Lamech, he decided that he would have two wives. And we read about this age in which Noah was called to walk with God. It was an age of immorality, fornication, and adultery. It was an age of iniquity and violence. The Bible tells us there that God said every imagination in verse 5, the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The whole heart and mind and worldview and philosophy and the heart and life of men and women in Noah's day, the Bible says, was evil continually. And every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. It was a vile world. And it was a world filled with wickedness and with violence. So much so that God Almighty said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the very face of the earth. Both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And you know, when you think about that, the wickedness and the violence and the vileness and the immorality, you think also of the complete indifference. If the thoughts of the heart was only evil, if the imagination of the heart was only evil, then it's saying there was no room for God in their thoughts. There was no room for God in their heart and life. And isn't that the age in which we are living? There's no room for God in the thoughts and the hearts 
and the minds of men and women. You only have to turn on some of the, the programs uh, where people ring in and if anyone wants to quote the Bible, they're, they're, they're called a dinosaur, they're called foolish, uh, and all the philosophies of this world and this age uh, are uh, perpetuated through the, the, these programs, uh, 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 and people uh, who believe the Bible, well, they're, they're just laughed at and scoffed and mocked because there's no room for God in the thoughts and in the mindset of men and women. Of room for pleasure and of room for business, but for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in the heart for which he died. And Jesus said, as it was in Noah's day, so it will be before the coming of the Son of Man. And the wonderful thing about God and his word is this, that the more degenerate the times, the more definite the testimony has God in this world. God had a special man for a special time. God had Noah in a day of darkness and wickedness. God had Moses to lead the people out from the land of Egypt. God had a Joshua to lead them in to the promised land. God had his men, the Savior's disciples. Uh, God had those 120 in the upper room who, after uh, they had been filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that they filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. And then it goes on even further, and it says not only did they fill Jerusalem with their doctrine, but the enemies of the gospel in Acts 17 said they have turned the world upside down. In reality, they were turning it right side up. But that's the kind of world we're living in. But the more de degenerate the times, the more definite God has his witness. So we read here that Noah's world was reprobate. Then I want you to notice, secondly, that Noah's walk was righteous. Noah's walk was righteous. We were singing, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. And the Bible says here that Noah found grace in verse 8 in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. We can say Noah's walk was righteous. Why? Because he was a favored man. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we often use the way acrostic for the word grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It is the unmerited favor of God to us. Noah was just a sinner. But he was a sinner, thank God, saved by grace. The apostle writes in Hebrews chapter 11, and he talks about Noah, and he says, By faith Noah was warned of God, and by faith Noah prepared an ark, and by faith Noah preparing an ark saved his house, and by faith Noah preparing an ark saving his house condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness which is by faith. So Noah was a favored man. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the Bible says here, Noah was a just man. We can say he was a forgiven man. He was in a right standing before God. When the world was condemned for its wickedness and its evil and its violence and its vice, Noah is described as a just man. That is a justified man. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The act of being justified means to be declared innocent or declared righteous. And thank God when the Lord Jesus Christ took our sins in his own body on the tree and he bore our sins 
and he bore our iniquities. Therefore, when we have faith in him, his perfect righteousness is imputed to us. It's like a garment, and we are clothed upon no longer, as Isaiah 64 says, with the, the, the filthy garments. We're clothed no longer with all our own righteousnesses, which are as filthy rags, but we're clothed upon with the perfect impeccable righteousness of the Lord Jesus. We are forgiven. We are forgiven. He was a favored man. He was a forgiven man. You know, he was a faithful man. For the Bible says he was perfect in his generations. And that speaks about Noah's character. As Noah lived in that world, he sought to serve God and to walk with God. He sought that in his home with his wife and before his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, he would be a faithful man of God. And we could say that he was a, a, a fellowshipping man because he walked with God. The Bible talks about Enoch in chapter 5 and verse uh, 21, Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Thank God for men who walked with God. As far as Enoch was concerned, we're told that for sixty-five year, years of his life he didn't walk with God. But a little child was born into his home, and that child was called Methuselah. And it's a peculiar name, but it means when he shall die, it shall come to pass. And it speaks about God was going to send a judgment on the world after the death of Methuselah. And perhaps that's why God allowed Methuselah to live for 969 years, because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But when there was no repentance, and there was no turning to God, and there was just evil uh, imagination continually, God must step in. But Noah was a man who fellowshiped, and he walked with God while the whole world wallowed in their sin. And you and I are called to walk with God in a sinful age. Noah was out of step with the world, but thank God he was in step with God. For the Bible says in the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? And Noah walked with God. He was in agreement with God. His heart, he loved the Lord. He wanted to please the Lord. He wanted to have fellowship with God. And though he was out of step with the world, he was in step with God. But Martin Luther, the great reformer, was that the Diet of Worms, and they accused him, and they said, Luther, we, we, we'll take away your church, and we'll take away your wife and your family, and We'll, we'll put you in jail. We'll, Luther, we'll, we'll even take away your life. Where will you be? And Luther replied, I'll be where I've always been, in the hand of my God. For he was a man who walked with God. And Noah was a, a fearful man. And I'm not talking now about a, a slavish, cringing fear of God, but a a fear of dishonoring God and a fear, as it were, of hurting God. In the uh, epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, it says there that Noah, being warned of God, was moved with fear. He had a reverence. That was his motive, a reverence for God. Heard about a young boy from a, a Christian home and he was with some friends and they, they wanted him to take part in something that was not right or not proper, not good, not wholesome. And because he refused to do so, they began to make fun of him and, uh, and they were saying to him, well, you're afraid of your father finding out and hurting you. He said, no, I'm afraid of hurting my father. 
if I went down that road. Noah feared God. And Noah was a family man. It says when he prepared the ark, Hebrews 11, he saved his house. It was a priority that Noah had for himself, for his wife, for his family. And he was a far-seeing man, for he became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah, his world was reprobate. Noah's walk was righteous. He had a great inheritance. Uh, God had an Elijah when the nation was gone off after Baal. God had a, a Daniel to lead the people there in their captivity in Babylon. And God wants you. And God wants me in our society to walk with him. So Noah's world was reprobate. And Noah's walk, his personal walk with God was a righteous one. You'll notice then that Noah's witness was real. Noah's witness was real. The whole world had gone after the pleasures of this world and the plentitude of this world. And it was lust and immorality and violence and wickedness. But Noah came living a, a righteous life before them. And he believed confidently in God. And he behaved consistently in his walk with God. And he besought God continually for his house and for the people. The Bible speaks about him in the New Testament as being a preacher of righteousness. The Bible talks about those 120 years when the ark was in preparing that there was a faithful witness, a man of God who preached righteousness. We often sing in the, the, the children's meeting in Sunday school, little children's chorus, Mr. Noah built an ark and the people thought it's such a lark and we get the boys and girls to do the actions and talk about the people thought it's such a lark and they're, of course they're pointing at their own heads. They might have suggested Noah's mad. We have never seen rain, never mind a flood. What's he building a huge boat for out here in this place? Where's he going to float it? He's mad. Of course, to the world, to the world, God's people are mad. I remember one night we were having a protest and uh, the late... Billy Hamilton was with us, and Billy was a character. And I remember people coming out of the place where we were protesting against, and it was uh, a public house, and the whole thing was going on. And this boy shouts at Billy, he says, Ah, oh, you're mad, he says. Well, Billy says, It's a blessed insanity, for he says, My sins are forgiven, and my soul is saved, and I'm on my way to heaven and home. Hallelujah. God's people might be out of step. But Noah's witness was real. Noah's witness was real. And as he prepared an ark, he warned the people. Warned the people. And we have to witness for him. It's an interesting little thought there if you read on through the chapter to verse 18 of chapter 6. God was speaking to Noah, and God says, But with thee will I establish my covenant and thou shalt come into the ark, thy and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Noah's word was reprobate, and Noah's walk was righteous, and Noah's witness was real. But you notice Noah's wife is recorded here. God records the fact that Noah had a wife. And Noah was called to an impossible task, seemingly, to build this huge ark to save precious souls, to preserve life, to float above the waters of God's wrath, to 
be lowered down again as the waters are swayed onto, as it were, a new earth, new place, cleansed. And I'm sure there were many, many times, many times, when Noah was discouraged and when he came home and he was fed up with the ridicule of the crowd, but Noah's wife supported him when he was ridiculed. Noah's wife, as mentioned here, she would be the one who would, as it were, shelter him in, in his uh, discouragement. She was the one who shared with him in this vision of the ark. She was a wife. She was a mother of the three sons and mother-in-law of three daughters, or daughters-in-law. In the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 31, that speaks about a virtuous woman and about a virtuous wife, it says her price was far above rubies. You know, there's many famous people who are spoken of in this world there's maybe many famous characters who stood for God in ages gone past and they had a faithful wife or a faithful husband or a faithful brother or sister who helped them in their work. And yet maybe they're known and their wife or their husband or their brother is on no one. I think of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English Baptist preacher, he preached in the Metropolitan Tabernacle to thousands. But Spurgeon had a brother. And his brother took note of his sermons. And his brother printed those sermons in his business. And they were called the Penny Pulpit. And so they were distributed. And we would not perhaps have all the wonderful books by Mr. Spurgeon and the sermons that he preached recorded word for word just as he preached them only for his brother. And yet we know Spurgeon and maybe we don't know about his brother. And Noah, thank God, as we close, his work was rewarded. His work was rewarded. His name literally means rest, rest. In his walk with God, he was a perfect man, just in his generations. He prepared the ark. And with that special family under the headship of Noah, they obtained the covenant blessing of God upon his home and upon his family. He built the ark because he had a heart for God. He had a heart even for the world, but he didn't heed the message. And he entered into the ark, and it has often been said, you read on through the book here, that they built the ark and they pitched the ark within and without with pitch. And the word in the Hebrew language is the word kafir, it's the word where from we get the, the, the thought of atonement. And so when Noah and his wife and family were on the inside of the ark, the ark was pitched inside and outside. And Noah looked, even as it were, the walls of the ark, and he could see the pitch that reminded him of the atonement. And when God looked down from heaven on the outside of the ark, he could see the pitch. It was pitched within and without. Because Noah was safe and secure from the wrath and the judgment of God that fell upon the world universally. It was a universal flood. If it wasn't a universal flood, they didn't need an ark. If it wasn't a universal flood, all they had to do was lead the animals, lead the people, go somewhere else. But it was a flood until all the high, every high mountain in this world was covered. It was a universal flood. And of course, the ark was made of special wood that speaks of the impeccability 
and the sinlessness, the incorruptible wood speaks of the incorruptible Christ. And they had the promise and the call from God to come and to enter in to the ark. So when we think about Noah, he teaches us to fear God. And he teaches us to be faithful to God. And it reminds us of the faithfulness of God to us as his people. May God bless his word to all our hearts this morning for his own dear name's sake.